and this is part two of our two-part video interview with uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi on the theme of Theravada themes in translation and there'll be a link to the first video. Uh, each of these is about 15 minutes long so we split it up into two. All right, hope you enjoy as much as I did. <laughs> so this is uh, the comprehensive manual of Abhidhamma, translation of the Abhidhammata Sangaha, yeah. um, which is a commentary of commentaries really extremely highly held in the Theravada Buddhist world, especially Burma, but really yeah, all of Southeast Asia. And mm. you include both commentary and comment and your own kind of introductions to these. Well, it has, I think I call them a guide to each of the sections. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the way this book came about, it wasn't completely original to me in any way, but there was an older sort of standard work called the Manual of Abhidhamma, which had been prepared by the old generation Sinhalese monk called Venerable Narada, very highly regarded. He had been the abbot of the, of the Vajirarama Monastery in Colombo. And when I was studying the Abhidhamma with my teacher, with Balangoda Ananda Maitreya, we used that book, but Venerable Ananda Maitreya pointed out a number of shortcomings in the book and gave more elaborate explanations on which I took notes. And then he had me, sort of my first assignment after learning a little bit of Pali, he gave me Lady Soyador's Paramatta Deepani, Lady Soyada, a great Burmese master of the late 19th, early 20th century. And he said, translate this. And it was in Burmese text. This is like a... It was in the Burmese script, script. which they had me... Yeah. I, I learned the Burmese script. Yeah. But it was in the Pali language, not the Burmese language. Mm -hmm. And so I got a lot of information from the Lady Soyada. Mm -hmm. But th that was in 1973. Yeah, 1973. But now we're... 20 years later? Mm. No, no, 19, about 1990, yeah, 1991-92, that period. So the, B, the Buddhist Publication Society had published Narada's Manual of Abhidhamma, and we'd run out of stock, and so it had to be reprinted. And it was my task as editor to go through and make some editorial changes. But as I was going through it, I saw a lot, a, there was a lot of informa more information that was needed to make it clear. Mm. And so I started to compose to each of the sections an explanatory guide. Mm. And then I would get information from a Burmese monk, a, a well-known Burmese monk living in England. This was U Uravita Dhamma Soyador. Mm. So I got information from him. And then one of my friends, a nun, who was ordained as a nun in Sri Lanka, then went back to, to the United States. She had studied Abhidhamma with another Burmese Soyador, U Silananda Soyador, and she had many of these tables and charts, Abhidhamma tables and charts, which she sent to me. And then I got permission from U Silananda to use those charts and tables mm -hmm. in this manual. And I got some other charts and tables from the Abhidhamma works published by the Pali Text Society. So it's very much a collaborative endeavor, that yeah. book. So that is great background just to see how much effort you and others mm. put into bringing this work about. And the theme I'd like to draw out for this one is just the value of Abhidhamma. This is yeah. you know, very much questioned. You know, some people may be new to Buddhism. You hear about the Tripitaka, these three baskets of Buddhism, and yeah. people would think that all Buddhists hold all three of them in yeah. the same high regard. Whereas similar to, you know, with the commentaries, you know, there are yeah. schools of Buddhism, maybe traditional Buddhists, conservative Buddhists. Yeah, Abhidhamma is you know, held as even more foundational than the suttas. Yeah. And then you've got people who just say, oh, it's clearly, you know, every historian agrees that it's later material. Yeah. Um, you know, later generations, just, you know, kind of overly analytical, mm. you know, brainy monks, you know, just kind of 
compiled this, made it up, you know, s saw these connections and just dismiss it. Too much time on the hand. Exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. Didn't want to meditate. So they needed <laughs> some way <laughs> instead of just sitting on the veranda and chewing the beetle <laughs> the leaf. They needed something to take up their time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's so. How do you personally reconcile that? What do, What do you feel is the value of Abhidhamma? For yeah, Buddhist first I, I agree with the historical, mm -hmm. the critical hi historical perspective, which mm -hmm. is that. The Abhidhamma is clearly, as it's come down to us, a product of later generations. You know, the full detailed systematization of the teachings that becomes the Abhidhamma Bitaka. And I believe that the what we call the Abhidhamma probably began with discussions amongst monks to explore in greater detail, in a kind of analytical detail, issues arising out of the Dhamma that we have in the suttas. Mm -hmm. So to provide, on the one hand we would say, provide detailed sort of formal definitions of terms that we find in the suttas, and then to explore the relations between the different concepts that we find in the suttas. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would have been maybe we call this the a primitive abhidhamma in the pre literary phase, and maybe that was a kind of common core which then, as the different monastic establishments set up their monasteries in different parts of India maybe all would have inherited to some degree that common core and then they would have elaborated that c common core in their own way in accordance with the thinking of the prominent dharma masters of their, of their respective schools, mm -hmm. probably working collaboratively because at least in the Theravada Abhidhamma, we don't have particular works ascribed to individuals where I believe in the Savastivada school, the different books are ascribed to individual, prominent individual monks. Interesting. Yeah, so the Theravada school ascribes the Abhidhamma to the Buddha, mm -hmm. but we don't find any text in which the Buddha is said to be teaching the Abhidhamma. Mm -hmm. So my belief would be the Abhidhamma um, is a collaborative work that reaches its canonical form over several centuries, maybe about three centuries. As for the value of the Abhidhamma, I say, first you have to be careful with the Abhidhamma, because I think people learn all of these very detailed concepts and the system, systematic analysis, memorize it, and think that this means that they're increasing in their wisdom or in their understanding of the Dhamma. But you can see the Abhidhamma providing a very detailed way of understanding the mind, the nature of the mind, different potential states of mind, and the nature of material phenomena and their interrelationships. In fact, I think in the... No, not in this work. It was in my introduction to... Nyanaponika Terra's Abhidhamma studies, I think it was there, I said that we could connect the project of the Abhidhamma with the Four Noble Truths. Okay, so we have the Noble Truth of Dukkha, which turns out to be the five aggregates and the twelve sense, sense bases and eighteen elements. And so when we have the detailed analysis of mentality, mind, mental factors, and material, material form in the Abhidhamma, that's the kind of detailed laying out, uh, mapping out of the first noble truth, just like Sariputta does in a more elementary way in the discor greater discourse on the elephant's footprint, Majima number 28. So the Abhidhamma carries that out in much greater detail. And with regard to mind, not only matter, 
Okay, then a large part of the Abhidhamma, particularly Dhamma Sangani, is concerned with all of the defilements that have to be eliminated and their relationships to each other and to mental and material phenomena. So that's a kind of detailed treatment of the second noble truth. The Abhidhamma doesn't say very much about the third noble truth. It just always brings it in as the asankata datu, the unconditioned element, and then elaborating upon it as the negation of the different defiled factors in the other two truths. And then a large part of the Abhidhamma, particularly we find this in the Vibhanga, the second book, gives detailed expositions of the 37, the seven groups which become the 37 Bodhipakki Dhammas, factors leading to enlightenment. So we find detailed technical um, analysis and elaborations on those factors. So that becomes a detailed treatment of the fourth noble truth. So you could almost take the Abhidhamma, at least those major books, and Um, move their contents or frame their contents or put their contents into the fr- framework of the Four Noble Truths. Wow, that's incredible. I had, I think I did read your intro to Abhidhamma studies and mm. didn't see that there, but looking... Well, maybe maybe I, I, maybe I brought that idea yeah. in when I gave some introductory lectures on the Abhidhamma. It's so good and it does just, I mean, the last book on the shelf, which I'm not sure we'll get to today, is your most recent one, Noble Truths, Noble Path, mm. and which is all about the Four Noble Truths. Yeah. And that is kind of where uh, orthodoxy or uh, ontology, the way things are, meet with orthopraxy or like yeah. the practical, yeah. like what you can actually do about it. So I think if someone had explained Abhidhamma to me the way you just did, yeah. as here's details of the Four Noble Truths, yeah. further definitions to understand them better, I think I would have put more time into the study. Um, but for the sake of moving forward, get to the first of your Bhikkhu Bodhi quintet, number two. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the middle length discourses of the Buddha, yeah. Yeah. which is your collating and um, work with Nyanamoli's manuscript yeah. and filling it out to fill out the middle length discourses. Yeah. So. Myself and Ajahn Nisipo right now are doing this Mission Majima yeah. project, and uh, you said that you watched one of the videos and you yeah, thought, yeah. thought it was well done. Two of them, yeah. Two of them. The, yeah. the introductory one and then the one on the Mula Pariyaya. Yeah. Good stuff, everybody. Just check it out. Um, but with this book, one of the there's so many themes that we could draw out here. Yeah. But one that I thought to draw out is just the theme of the Buddha, who the Buddha was, yeah. who is this character yeah. of the Buddha. You know, even just having gone through 10 suttas so far in that Mission Majima yeah. Sutra, uh, Mission Majima project, anyone who reads it meets yeah. a very human Buddha. Yeah. This is someone who's walking yeah. around in places that still exist. Yeah. Yeah. And that's somewhat um, perhaps at odds who, with people in some Buddhist schools even who have a more grandiose or even yeah. deified yeah. Yeah. idea yeah. of the Buddha. Yeah. And But we also find a human who reaches a transcendent state, which is also something which other modern yeah. Buddhists yeah. might just say, oh, there's no, there's no real end to greed, anger, and just delusion. Mm. You know, it's he could see them very well, and uh, mm. that's his transcendence. But mm. what would you, how would you draw this theme of, as you were translating this, and just through your whole yeah. growing understanding of the Buddha, yeah. who, who, or what was the Buddha, and what was or. Yeah, maybe that's a place to start. Okay. But yeah. first, uh, I want to modestly say that the translation of the Majjhima Nikaya is not my work. Mm. As you know, it's the work. There were these ma- manuscripts left by the great British translator uh, Bhikkhu Nyanamoli, mm. who died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 54. And nobody knew that he had translated the Majjhima Nikaya. He was very modest. <laughs> and reclusive and didn't tell people what he was working on. And so after his death, when they went to his cabinet, they found these three notebooks, hand-bound notebooks, big notebooks, which 
This one was a translation of the Majjhima Nikaya. Handwritten or typed there? No, handwritten, handwritten. Wow. with a fountain pen. Mm -hmm. And so they sent them up to Kandy to Venerable Nyanaponika, and he was keeping them in his, he had a big trunk, he was keeping them in the trunk. And I think it's 1976, the, at that time the British monk Bhikkhu Kantipalo came to Sri Lanka, and he selected, I think, 90 suttas from those notebooks and had them typed up and published in three volumes in Bank in Thailand in Bangkok. Then at that time the executive director of Wisdom Publications had heard that Jnana Moli had left behind a complete translation of the Majjhiminikaya. And Wisdom had already published Maurice Walsh's translation of the Diganikaya. So Wisdom wanted to publish the Majjhiminikaya. So they wrote to Venerable Nyanapunika saying that they heard that Nyanapunika has the handwritten notebooks of Venerable Nyanamoli's translation of the Majjhiminikaya. Can you, Nyanapunika, pre please prepare them for us for publication? Mm -hmm. And Venerable Nyanapunika is 83 years old at the time, so he writes back that I'm now 83, my vision is deteriorating, but I have a young American monk staying with me <laughs> who has a good knowledge of Pali, who's done some previous translation work. I'm putting that task onto him. <laughs> so then I prepared those notebooks. We went through Nyanamoli's translation. I made some modifications in his terminology, and then I added the introduction, notes, glossary, index, and maybe some other back features. Okay, as for th that's a, sort of the background. Yeah, that's then great background. The question was how the, I see the Buddha. Yeah, and the person of the Buddha. What, how does that emerge from this this work? And you know, you say that the Buddha is very human, but the Buddha, as depicted, doesn't have the faults of a human being. So mm. this is not a humanized Buddha in the sense, oh, he has all of the faults, the weaknesses, the defects, the shortcomings that any other human being has. Mm. This is a being who's human in that he's living in the human world. And as he gives his account, he starts off as a deluded worldling as one who lives pursuing, he says, how did I, pursuing things that are subject to decay, to birth, or decay and destruction, and he enumerates. So he was living as a human being, but once he achieves Buddhahood, like all of the defilements are gone, or you never see the Buddha saying, when he's asked the question, saying, oh, I don't really know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll be asked questions that are considered irrelevant, he'll put them aside, mm -hmm. but he is still a human being, but he's a human being from whom all, let's say, emotive, defiling emotions have been eliminated, and all obstructions to proper cognition, mm -hmm. co proper understanding have been shattered and taken down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fascinating, because even as I was saying, you know, in different Buddhist schools, you've yeah. got, say, a commentarial understanding that the Buddha was like an uber-human, in that he's like, you know, I don't know, two meters or three meters tall, and, you know, has... That's rather strange in the commentaries, yeah. because, I mean, they always say that the Buddha's invited to a house for a meal. <laughs> the house owner doesn't break down the wall, <laughs> break, open up the door <laughs> so that the being two meters high can get through. <laughs> right, right. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't. Yeah, no one sees the Buddha moving around. He might have been, I mean, he's from the Kshatriya warrior clan, yeah. so he must have been tall and strong physically, but not superhuman tool. Right. And you don't get the 
image of a Buddha that you find maybe in other schools that have like this, like a celestial or a um, Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya. Yeah, that is what you find yeah. in the, at least in some of the Mahayana Mahayana. sutras where the sutra always begins that the Buddha enters and well it starts off at the sutta it seems like the human Buddha Mm -hmm. but then he goes into samadhi (laughs) and either (laughs) within the samadhi or coming out from the samadhi he radiates beams of light that spread out to all the ten directions Mm -hmm. and then other world systems appear, and the Buddhas in those world systems appear, and those Buddhas send their attendant bodhisattvas to visit the Buddha Shakyamuni. Yeah. So you get a kind of, it's a scene that puts the heavenly realms to shame. With right. It. <laughs> right, right, right. Or in the Lotus Sutra, where he didn't actually attain enlightenment. He wasn't even born. He, you know, he was, um, yeah, he was always enlightened. Yeah. And it was just kind of yeah. a show to yeah. inspire some yeah. people. So yeah. that's not what you find in the... the no, poem. no, one finds very yeah. clear that he's... How does he put I too, before my enlightenment... It's in Bajimin number 26. I have to look in the mm-hmm. sutra to get mm-hmm. the exact wording. I too, as one subject to old age sought after things that are also subject to decay Mm -hmm. as one subject to death i saw things that are also subject to death as one subject to defilements i saw saw things that are Mm -hmm. subject to defilements arya pariyasana sutta yeah that's the the arya pariyasana sutta well i think what you're mentioning about you know shooting out the rays and all these other beings occurring i mean that's kind of leads into my next, or the next theme I'd like to draw is, as I understand it, your understanding and the picture that emerges from the Pali Nikayas is yeah, this theme of the Buddhist worldview, the Buddhist cosmology, the Buddhist yeah. universe. And so this is yeah, the connected discourses of the Buddha, which you translated next, and would love to hear anything you wanted to say about this. And then also to just draw this theme you know, the first two Sanyutas or grouped discourses are about, you know, devas yeah. and young devas. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so the picture that emerges of a Buddhist cosmos yeah. is not a yeah. secular Western materialist yeah. 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 worldview. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so curious if, if you would be willing to kind of draw, draw that out, yeah. Yeah. the implications of yeah. that. Okay, these are things that I can't say definitively on the basis of any kind of supersensory vision. Um, but the Buddha is lauded in the suttas. One of the nine epithets, qualities of the Buddha is Sata Deva, Deva Manasaran. So he's the teacher of Devas, deities in human beings. And in, I think, probably all the Nikayas, we see encounters between the Buddha and deities, mm-hmm. and it's the deities that come to the Buddha for instruction, for guidance. It's mm-hmm. not the Buddha going to <laughs> the gods for for guidance. Mm-hmm. So it could be, I mean, this is, it could swing either way. One way to look at it, like these verse collections, which are the discourses with the devas and with the young devas and then later there's discourses with yakas you could take a kind of critical maybe secular skeptical view that okay there were these verses and legends floating around and they came to be incorporated in these collections so there's like floating verses in fact some of the verses that one finds in say the deva sangyuta one will find Elsewhere, maybe in the Teragata, Terigata, ascribed to monks Mm. and nuns, or elsewhere ascribed to the Buddha himself. So we just don't know how these verses arose, uh, these verse collections. So in my own way of thinking, I just have no doubt that there are multiple realms of existence, deva realms, 
and that since the Buddha is a supremely enlightened one and part of his mission is to proclaim the Dhamma amongst devas and human beings, that devas would have come to the Buddha for instruction, the Buddha would have used means, these abhidis, supernormal powers, to go to the deva worlds to instruct the devas. And I find it's just sort of the limits of our own knowledge that make us that generate skepticism about the existence of these other realms. Mm -hmm. And probably I have to say, in our highly industrialized technological societies, they chase the devas away. Mm. The actual machinery of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. The devas, like sort of clean, pure environments, sparsely populated, so maybe in areas where people are living very simple, traditional lives, very quiet, no mechanical devices, electric power devices, electronic devices, the devas would find it much more congenial to come and to interact with human beings. Something which I, and I think many, appreciate about the way that you talk about the suttas, I mean, obviously your knowledge of the scope of the suttas is pretty comprehensive, but you're so careful about describing, you know, what is in the suttas versus your own belief. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. Uh, Doug Smith, mm -hmm. you know, is in your, your poly class and um, he certainly can appreciate it. He's, you know, very much has secular Buddhist roots. Mm -hmm. um, but you speak about these things so carefully that it doesn't, you don't try to impose mm -hmm. what your belief is on anyone else. I, I am curious if you could speak to the usefulness or the benefit of being open to adopting this view. I mean, it's part of mundane right view, yeah. as you find in the Great Forty Sutta of Majima, yeah. um, Majima Nikaya, that there is this world, there is the next world, yeah. and yeah. there are spontaneously yeah. arisen beings. Um, and yeah, what is, so that's part of the suttas. Yeah. And what utility does that serve, taking on that view or, or that belief? Okay, the understanding, or you could even call it belief, in multiple planes of existence will help us to get what I call the comprehensive background view of what's entailed by adopting the Buddha Dharma and practicing the Buddha Dharma. And so when you reject all of those other realms of existence reject the teaching of rebirth and then you give a purely temporal or secular interpretation to karma so the karma loses its capacity since there are no other realms of existence and no rebirth and karma you just have to you'd love for just a purely psychological interpretation of karma mm. which i've seen so widespread amongst western buddhists mm. which really loses the full meaning of of karma mm. okay so when you have this view of other realms the multiple realms of existence coupled with the teaching of rebirth then you see the vast cosmic background against which the buddha the drama of the buddha mm. dhamma unfolds mm. that it's a way to liberation from this process of repeated existence which can take place in many many different dimensions of existence and you also come to understand you know this is from a very powerful ethical point of view the capacity or potency of our different actions and our different moral choices one understands that our behavior our conduct has the capacity to lead to existence even over long periods of time in either higher worlds, more blissful, more peaceful worlds, or in lower worlds and realms of intense suffering. You know, when you if you just take a purely secular view, you could still have very high moral standards so that you wouldn't act unethically, but 
let us say, the understanding of the potentialities of ethical, of moral, and immoral behavior are circumscribed by the limits of one's view, mm. the limits of one's understanding. Mm. Wow, thank you. I think I'll have to listen to that again. <laughs> mm. um, we're actually making surprisingly okay time. Um, this uh, next work is are the numerical discourses of the Buddha, the translation of the Anguttara Nikaya, and I believe this was published in 2011 or 2013. At any rate, it was something around then, and I remember being as a it young. Might have monk, been 2012. Yeah, that's what this one. 2012. 2012. Yeah. And I remember I came to a monastery in 2006, and I remember reading you know, partial translations from real publications of certain yeah. suttas, and just being so excited hearing rumors that this was going to be put out. In 2006. Then, that's when I first came to the monastery? Yeah. Well, and then, maybe not then yet, but then when I moved to Abayagiri and ordained certainly in 2010, there's always this anticipation, any day it's going to come out. And uh, yeah. so I was so excited when it finally did. And there's obviously so much that we could draw out of this work, yeah. which is, for people who haven't read, I mean, any of these, as you can see, they're beautifully made, the, these yeah. wisdom editions, they're sit beautifully on your shelf, and even better if you can read them. Yeah. Um, great, amazing um, index and notes. In this volume especially, Bhante starts going and comparing with the Chinese Agamas, mm -hmm. so other related versions of yeah. the suttas. Um, you know, one thing I thought to draw from this is just the Uttara Sutta, which we've been just talking yeah. about on our walks. So this is Anguttara 8.8. .8. Yeah. And the principle that's said there is Whatever is well spoken, subhasi tongue, yeah. yeah. that, all that, uh, mm. whatever is well spoken is all the word of the blessed one, the noble yeah. one, yeah. the perfectly enlightened one. Yeah. And that's a huge opening. It's yeah. said by a monk, you know, and then sort of approved by the Buddha, or mm. um, the Buddha says something similar. But mm. what is your understanding? That seems like a, a big opening for a lot. I mean, the Mahayana canon is yeah. different from the Theravada yeah, canon yeah. in that they include things that are, they don't even try to pretend that it's the word of the Buddha. Yeah, yeah. Like the Six Patriarch Sutra from yeah. 500, 600 yeah. AD yeah. is in the Chinese Mahayana yeah. canon. Yeah. But there's, you don't find anything that's expressly, expressly and admittedly later in the Pali canon. I mean, um, in that, yeah, I mean, Traditionally speaking, you know, people would say even things, these um, works like Buddha Chari, uh, Apadana, Buddha, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Buddha, Buddha Vangsa, Chari Pitaka, yeah. those are, it seems like from a different strata, but yeah, um, yeah. but yeah, Mahayana takes it to another level. Yeah, and here's yeah. a monk who lived, you know, maybe 900 years, 800 years after, 1,000 years after the Buddha, and that's included, but so how do you understand the, the import, this theme of whatever is well said is all the word of the Buddha? I think one has to be a bit cautious mm. Mm. with that. Mm. Because then, as I said yesterday evening, mm. then you could include maybe the Sermon of the Mount is very beautiful. Mm. <laughs> you could say that's the word of the Buddha. Huh. Maybe if there's good sayings of Albert Einstein or some... A contemporary wise writer mm. to say that's Buddha Vachana. Mm. No, I think we need some criterion for mm. distinguishing what's Buddha Vachana is what's not. But say things like the Mahayana Sutras, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that the Buddha Vachana in any kind of literal sense that mm. they were spoken by the Buddha, but one could say that at least some principles in the Mahayana Sutras, maybe are the ways like later generations are trying to draw out implications mm -hmm. from principles laid out in the Buddhism of the archaic period mm -hmm. and then sort of develop them in, in a new direction, mm -hmm. maybe to form like the doc doctrinal backdrop to the Bodhisattva path. 
yeah, that's kind of just the opening. That, yeah. that, so, that uh, you know, makes. I like to keep the expression Buddha Vachana pretty much confined to things that we could reasonably ascribe to mm. the historical Buddha. Mm. So I don't even like to say that the Abhidhamma is Buddha Vachana. Mm -hmm. I say that it is again that it's an elaboration of the mm. teachings of the Buddha mm -hmm. that they've received or the Abhidhamma treatises have received canonical status. So mm. we have to say that it's in one sense it's Buddha Vachana and that is part of the Pali canon. Mm. But if you take Buddha Vachana as things that are actually spoken by the Buddha or that can be reasonably ascribed to him, then I say the Abhidhamma is not Buddha Vachana, but it doesn't mean that it's Anti Buddha Vachana. Mm, 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 mm. That's a good distinction. Yeah. That's a very useful distinction. I might just, so the Sutta Nipata is the fourth yeah, of the quartet, yeah. part two. Um, Going to this next book, which uh, I've read, and I think yeah. many people, it's part of the curriculum at Dharma Ram Buddhist University, the Buddhist teachings on social and communal mm. harmony. And this has, just has fantastic teachings from the canon with your commentary and introduction yeah. uh, about being generous about keeping precepts and having a moral sensitivity yeah. about service, about family relations. Um, the theme that I'd be curious to draw out would be specifically about generosity. I yeah. mean, and I know you've done a lot yeah. Yeah. in the field of generosity and Buddhist generosity, your work with Buddhist global relief. Yeah, yeah. Could you speak to that? Okay, the seed idea that eventually developed into Buddhist global relief. This goes back to the time when the South Asian tsunami took place and it struck the countries of South Southeast Asia, including Sri Lanka. And when I heard that news, I was living at a, another monastery at a place called Bodhi Monastery in New Jersey. I wanted to raise funds to provide to organizations doing relief work in Sri Lanka. And so I sent out an email to some of the, my students at Bodhi Monastery, but I also sent the email to Bhante Gunaratna at the Bhavana Society, who sent it out to everybody on his mailing list, the Bhavana Society mailing list. And I sent it to a woman who was, I think, on the board of the Insight Meditation Center in New York City, mm. the branch of IMS in New York City. And she sent it to everybody on their mailing list. Mm. So within about two weeks, we got about $160,000. And then it was my task to find the organizations to provide it, uh, to distribute those that money to. And I think the New York, it was Google, I think, had compiled the list of organizations that were working mm. in Sri Lanka. And I thought I would choose Buddhist organizations. Mm. And I looked at the list, and there were many Christian organizations, Jewish organizations, Muslim organizations. But I think I came across maybe two Buddhist organizations, the Tsuji Foundation, which is based in Taiwan, and maybe Sarvodhya. And it struck me, you know, in Buddhism, we speak so much about kindness, compassion, generosity. But when it comes to really helping people in need, people in urgent, critical need, mm. we're missing in action. Right. And so in 2007, the Buddhist magazine, Buddha Dharma, invited me to write an editorial essay. And so I wrote an essay pointing out in my opinion, how Buddhism or Buddhists are not looking at what I call the real, concrete, tangible suffering that affects billions of people around the world as their everyday reality. You know, we just have these sort of sometimes these grandiose, beautiful ideas of sitting in the meditation hall. <laughs> I've got given these instructions thousands of times, sending loving kindness, 
spreading the light of loving kindness to envelop the whole globe. But when it comes to actually getting on, to, uh, rolling up our sleeves and getting on the ground, we're absent. And so I wrote that essay, and then it, Buddha Dhamma titled it "A Challenge to Buddhists." Mm. Then I didn't t- tell any of my friends or students about it, but th- some of them got the magazine and read it, and then we started having some conversation that it's need, it's necessary for us as Buddhists to take up the challenge was presented in that essay. And so we had these initial discussions and then we decided to form a Buddhist relief organization. And then we needed a specific mission of particular focus. And we decided to focus on the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition around the world. And so we started with a few projects, but then as we went on just with three preliminary projects, pilot projects, as we looked into like the underlying roots of hunger and malnutrition and poverty around the world, two of the factors that stood out was the subordinate status of girls in many traditional societies, just one, and the subordinate status of women in traditional societies, the lack of educational opportunities for girls. And so we expanded our mission instead of just providing direct food aid, but that is one sort of task is providing direct food aid to people affected directly by hunger and malnutrition. But the second approach is providing opportunities for girls to go to school and to continue their education, even through high school and university. And then a third prong, so to speak, is to give women the opportunity to support women and give them the opportunity to start right livelihood projects or to find employment in order to earn more to support their family. And people can find out more information at Buddhist Yeah, they can just simply go to Google and go search for Buddhist Global Relief. Okay. Yeah, that is, it is a very good point yeah. to look at, like how is one and giving, giving. How is one being generous yeah. in one's life? And you know, there is a narrow Buddhist view which you point to of like, yeah. you know, that maybe the act of generosity that you see most in the suttas is just giving to monks. Yeah. yeah. Whereas your, it's this Buddhist global relief is a, a yeah. bigger vision. And yeah. the Buddha praised that. The Buddha said, yeah. you know, someone asked, "Where should I give?" And he says, "Give where you feel inspired." And yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a really useful organization. Yeah. Yeah. I hope people can support. Yeah. It. We started with three projects, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, and. Mm-hmm. 2008, and currently we have almost 60 projects in countries ranging from Mongolia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Sri Lanka, actually if I, uh, Sri Lanka, India, then several African countries, Uganda, Malawi, Cote d'Ivoire, Haiti, Nicaragua, Peru, and some places in the United States. Sadhu, sadhu, yeah. sadhu. Maybe just one last book? Yeah. All right. So this is uh, one of your recent books, Reading the Buddha's Discourses in Pali. Yeah. And I think that it goes, it takes uh, different suttas and goes, it gives a word-by-word yeah. uh, analysis in Pali, and it's just a great resource for maybe intermediate level or yeah, yeah. beginner, intermediate level yeah. poly students? Maybe not beginner. Okay, intermediate. Unless they're, unless they're <laughs> extremely talented with languages. Super yeah. talented. And so the theme I want to draw out here is just the value of poly. What, yeah. What's the value that you've found in yeah. learning and studying in the poly language? And if that would be useful to draw out. Okay, one thing is that poly is. Phonetically, it's a very beautiful language, the sounds, the rhythm. And then when you read it, you know, this uncertainty whether Pali is the actual language used by the Buddha himself. But even if the Buddha used a somewhat different language, Pali and the language that the Buddha used would have been very, very close. You know, one is just a, a dialect of the other. And so when you're reading in Pali, you get the sense that you're 
reading the words that the Buddha himself used. You know, even if he said samjya rather than sanya, mm. or vijnana rather than vijnana, mm. but the words are so close that you get the sense that you're reading, and some even prefer to listen to the suttas mm -hmm. it, it recited in Pali. You get the sense that you're hearing the actual Buddha word. So that is one sort of, you call it an inspirational advantage, then more from a perspective of intellectual understanding. You know, the words used by the Buddha for a, often for quite technical and very precise in meaning. And when you rely on an English translation, even good ones, <laughs> like these, like those, yeah. <laughs> like those. Like <laughs> um, when you re rely on <laughs> English, even good English translations, you're still getting them through the the, the Buddha's teachings through the medium of another language in which mm. the words have different resonances, mm. different connections different sort of underlying, sometimes metaphorical echoes. Yeah. And you don't see, like if you read one person's translation of this sutta and another person's translation of that sutta, you don't see the connections of the stock phrases or the pericope. Yeah, yeah. You don't see those connections. Yeah. Well, Bonte, you've been so generous with your time. Um, this has been a real joy for me. We probably will break this up into two segments. Mm. Um, but yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed this and uh, I hope everyone can take advantage of Bonte. He does offer teachings every Saturday online in the mornings and Wednesday evenings as well. Wednesday is just the meditation, the okay. guided meditation. Are those oh, online? Actually, we have the chanting, the Pali chanting from 7 till usually to 7.15. Okay. And we have a guided love, a metta loving kindness meditation mm. and from about uh, 7.15, 7.20 to 8 or 8.05. And that's online as well. I can find yeah, a link. Yeah, but people have to register okay. to, get on, to get the links. Okay. Is there any other way that people can, I mean, all of your books are available, well, many of them through Wisdom yeah. or through the Pariyati, yeah. um, Pariyati Press? Yeah. So people can definitely, as you can see, they're beautiful. People yeah. should order them. Any other way that you feel like people can um, hear more of your teachings or, or yeah, know I think more? Through YouTube, like all of the talks that I gave here at Zhuangyan Monastery, I think from okay, 2010, about 2016, I did talks on the Majjhima Nikaya. Mm. I think the early ones were done during the period when YouTube was not allowing long YouTube videos, mm. so they, some of them were broken up into segments. Mm. But then later, the whole talks were mm. on YouTube. So there was talks on the Majjhima Nikaya. Then I think after doing that, 2016 maybe, 2017, then I started talks on selected suttas from the Ankutara Nikaya, mm -hmm. and there are lots and lots of them available mm -hmm. on the on YouTube. And then if anybody's interested in the Abhidhamma, over Labor Day weekend, starting 2016, 17, 18, 19, I went through the entire comprehensive manual of Abhidhamma. And so you would find that you would go into the YouTube search, my name, Abhidhamma, start off and then put the year 2013 mm. to get the first series. Mm. And then after that, I think you can get from 2014, 2015, 2016. Mm. Yeah, so for anyone doing the Mission Majjhima project, um, yeah, we just have our nine or 10 minute videos, <laughs> but Bhante will sometimes have like four or five or six hour plus long videos yeah. so people we do put links to those. People should check that out. And yeah, in these other ways, my questions might not have been the best for you to be able to see it, but Bonte is both, as you could tell with this, very erudite, uh, very circumspect, very careful with how he speaks, 
but also he is hilarious. So, Bonte, thank you so much for letting me come and visit. Okay, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you.